In this episode of the podcast, we're talking to my friend, Jen Rosenbaum. Now, Jen is an entrepreneur. She's a podcaster, a photographer. She's a published author, an educator, public speaker. The list goes on and on. And adding to all of this, she's a mother as well as a breast cancer survivor. In fact, three years ago, she went through the process of breast cancer while balancing everything on her workload at the time. It's gonna be a deeply personal conversation. We're gonna walk through Jen's experience and what it was like to navigate going through breast cancer and recovery while juggling a business and her role as a leader and an educator inside of the photography industry. We're also going to talk about how those perspectives have shifted and how she's changed and grown through the process and kind of what's coming to the future of her life in terms of where is she moving and what are her passions moving towards having gone through these experiences. That and a whole bunch more. You guys are going to enjoy the episode. Let's go ahead and jump in. This is the TSS podcast. It's a place for authentic conversations to uncover the stupid, simple truths that help us succeed in business, create better relationships, and lead more fulfilling lives. Welcome to Think Stupid Simple. Jen, may I call you Jen? Please. I assume. Because I'd be weird if you called me something different, because that's my name. (laughs) (laughs) And tell me, who is this friend of yours? This is my little dog, Texi. Oh, he doesn't like to be left out of anything. So cute. Texie. I love the name. His name is Tex. He's from Texas, but we call him Texie. I love it. He's a little rescue. What, what (laughs) kind of dog is he? So we didn't know. And for a long time, everybody was like, Oh, he's just a terrier. You know, I'm like, yeah, he's a terrier. And then we had him genetic tested Uh and it it turns out he's 50% Chihuahua. What? Isn't that weird? He doesn't look like a Chihuahua at all. We thought he was like a Westie maybe. What is the other 50%? A mix of everything except Terrier. He's like 5% Terrier. That's crazy. It's so weird. Schnauzer. I don't know. Well, he's adorable. Thank you. uh, He's a good boy. Texie. I like the name. I have a a ritual, Jen. Texie, Texie. Oh, we're doing this by candlelight? We light candles when we start. Oh, Oh, wait. I should get my candle. Can I get my candle? Because you're going to love it. Light it up. Okay, and I don't know you if you can I also light your candle if you want to. I, I'm gonna light it. Hold on. But if you got other things to light up, please. Okay, I don't think I have matches here, but I'm gonna show you my candle that I keep in my office. <laughs> it says "badass." Any scent I effing want. That is. That might as well be your brand of candle. Like if, if you were to have funny. a brand of candle, it would be the badass candle company. <laughs> Mental note, do that. I have another one too that says something here like busy bitches get, you know, stuff done. Doesn't really go like that, but you know, yeah. You need to badass candle company. And it needs to be like the shirts need to say like back off, you know, like B-A-C-C right. off. <laughs> Look at this. You got a whole... I love it. I'm, I'm here to give. I'm here to give. Thank Jen, you. thank you. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Um, you are a mover and shaker in every sense of the term. Now, I already gave you a lovely intro. Well, you don't know this because I'm actually going to film it after the fact, but you will have this lovely intro. But I, I'm happy that you're guaranteeing it. Thank you. Oh, I guarantee it. That's part of why you're paying me to do this. Um, <laughs> so amazing. I'll bend well you. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, my friend, um, you are an incredible human being. I want to list out like some of the things that you've done. And, but as I think about it, I'm like, okay, not only is this list long, I feel like at the top, we need to start with the fact that you are a breast cancer survivor. You have beat that. Um, not only that, but you've, you've become a a, a voice in that arena. Yes. Yeah. I I would like to think so. So thank you. (laughs) Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'm an advocate for, women, because I really found that when I was diagnosed back in 2017, I did what everybody does when they get diagnosed with cancer, they go to the internet and it's filled with horrendously scary stuff Yeah, and not real stuff and stuff where you see, you know, 80 year olds that have cancer and and that's great. But what about the 40 somethings? What about the 30 somethings? What about the women that are, you know, trying to raise children and take care of aging parents and running a business and 
still having breast cancer. You know, there was really, I didn't really find a voice for that. So I think over the last few years has been quite a movement of not just me, but a lot of women in their thirties, forties, fifties, in twenties that uh, are really speaking out about the realities of breast cancer and good, bad, and ugly. Yeah. It kind of, it kind of blows my mind. I think I read on your website, um, that your family has no history of this, right? Like it was just one day you woke up and yeah. How did, how did even, you know? So even that, by the way, let me just talk about that for one second, because that's really important. That, that's the number one thing. Every time you go to get a mammogram or anything, everybody says you have a family history. Do you know that people that get breast cancer, there's only, only 15% of people that get breast cancer have a family history. Why, why it's is not that like such it's a, 90%. It's yeah. not like it's like, oh, well, a family history means you're going to get it or not having a family history means you're not going to get it. It's important to know because of genetics, there's a lot of genetic components there, but it just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean that you're not going to get cancer. I mean, and when I say I have zero history in my family, I mean, I have zero, not just of breast cancer. There was like no cancer in my family. So it was really shocking. And honestly, of everybody in my family, I was the one that was, you know, drinking the green juice and going to yoga and doing all the things that hopefully would avoid cancer. So it was... Yeah. Very shocking. So it's funny that you asked me how I knew. Um, I took a selfie one day uh, and I noticed in the selfie that there was a shadow on the upper part of my chest, like a bump. No way. And I swear to you, if I was not a photographer, I never would have known. And I started feeling around. It was really high up. I'm wearing black today, so you guys can't really see, but it was pretty high up in my chest, like like a little bit, maybe a couple of inches below my collarbone. I was like, this feels really weird. I don't know what this is, but I had just had a mammogram a few months before and I just figured, I don't know, maybe it's a swollen muscle. It didn't feel like a lump that we're taught to feel for. You know, we're always taught as women feel for a pea-sized lump. It didn't feel like that. It felt like a swollen muscle. And I just was like, no, I was just at the doctor. I have another appointment in July. I'll get it checked out then. It'll be fine. And when I went in July, they were just uh, checking on some cysts that were on my side. They said, your cysts are fine. And I said, you know, before I leave, I almost forgot. I have this thing here. I mean, I I almost forgot. Like, that's how much I didn't think about it. And she was just kind of looking. And then she pressed really hard. And this, like, giant black hole showed up on the sonogram machine. And I was like, what is that? She was like, I got to go get the doctor. So the doctor came in. He said, I'm not letting you leave without a biopsy. Um, he put what's called a titanium marker in there. So they put a little piece of titanium in there. And the reason they do that is because it shows up on the mammogram. So they did another mammogram and you could see very clearly on the mammogram, there's a titanium marker and no sign of cancer, nothing. So it's crazy. So my cancer did not show up on a mammogram. And when I tell you that I had stage two B, I had two masses, one was seven centimeters and one was three centimeters. And it did not show up on a mammogram Holy crap. only partially showed up on a sonogram. And it only partially showed up on an MRI. And I ended up having a double mastectomy. And when I had the mastectomy, my surgeon said to me, your breast was littered with cancer. That's insane. Yeah. So there's two kinds of cancer. I just want to say this for those who, uh, cause I want to follow up on the whole, it didn't feel like a lump. Um, I had what's called invasive lobular carcinoma. Mm-hmm. There's ductal and there's lobular ductal feels like a lump ductal okay. carcinoma has a protein that keeps the cells together that forms a lump. And that's what we're taught to feel for. That's more common than invasive lobular carcinoma, but lobular is missing that protein. So what happens is it spreads through the lobules of your breast. And so what it feels like is more of like a swollen muscle or like a long, mine was like a long, long mass. Like it felt like a swollen muscle. It's the best way I know how to describe it. Yeah. And because I didn't feel a lump, I didn't think anything of it. So I want women to know out there, number one, if you feel anything different, it's okay to call your doctor. Yeah. You know, to an extent there's a, and I almost feel like women might even have this worse, but there's a certain like tough it out mentality of like, Oh, it's not a big deal. Like, you I don't know, want to bother you. Yeah, I don't want to like, I don't want to be a bother. Um, that was me. I was like, Oh wait, I have an appointment in six, you know, a few weeks. It'll be fine. So now to clarify, because a lot of people might not know what a double mastectomy is. This is the removal of your breasts, like yes. they're gone. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I removed my breasts. Um, and I had a very, um, radical mastectomy. I had all the tissue removed all the way up to my collarbone. 
Um, so I'm just like skin and bones over here. I have had reconstruction. I've been through four reconstruction surgeries. Um, my last one was two and a half weeks ago. Um, and yeah, it's a process, but yeah, I had an amputation of my breast basically. And that is what it is. I really want to be clear about that. Cause I think that a lot of people think, and I, something I thought before I went through this process, okay, so you'll remove your breast and you'll get implants and you'll look great. And it's not like that at all, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it is an amputation and I know, you know, there are women who do have a genetic component for breast cancer. And if you have a genetic component for breast cancer, then your like likelihood of getting breast cancer is something like 85%, something crazy. So a lot of women do it, uh, prophylactically or risk reducing, they call it. Um, so those women never had cancer and have mastectomies and it's still traumatic. It's still very difficult for them because it is an amputation. That's crazy. And it's not just an amputation of a body part, right? It's an amputation of identity, femininity. It's, it's a lot more than just a body part. That's what I actually want to pull up. Um, do you mind pulling up Jen's, uh, Instagram? One of the things that I've really appreciated and it's honestly helped me to understand it better is you're very open and vulnerable about posting. I think yeah. part of this probably comes with the fact that you, you photograph women, um, at their most vulnerable, uh, okay. you, you, you do boudoir work, you help to rebuild, you know, confidence and self-esteem, and this is your work, okay. but seeing these images in particular, the images of you, um, after yeah. these surgeries and, uh, it gave me a far better understanding of what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know that, especially guys, um, that we have any idea of, you hear the term double mastectomy, but unless you see the imagery, you really have no clue. Yeah. Um, so those two, there's two right there that are from my last surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you can see the scars, you can see the bruising. Um, I didn't know what it was either. You know, I really didn't, I didn't know what to expect and, um, I didn't know, um, <sighs> sometimes I still don't know, <laughs> you know, what does this entail? What does it actually mean? What is the healing process for this? Some of the things that I've gone through, I've gone through more than once, like fat grafting, for example. So what they'll do is they'll take fat from a part of your body and they'll use it to sort of fill in around the implants a little bit. Um, I've had it done three times and every time I have it done, it feels different than the time before. So, um, you know, it's, it's a process, it's a learning process and everybody has a different experience. It's not, a one size fits all. And I think, unfortunately, we're getting a lot of information from doctors who say, this is how it's going to feel. These are the side effects, but they've never been through it themselves. For sure. They don't know what the real problems are. You know, like for example, when I had had my mastectomy, I had a lot of back pain, so much back pain, like, you know, because you're, it's very heavy and you're kind of hunched over. And after you have your surgery, you can't raise your arms. I mean, I couldn't raise my arms any higher than this wow. at all. So you have to like go through therapy. You have to do physical therapy five times a day on your own. So you can eventually raise your arms up. And I had terrible back pain. And I remember saying to somebody once, do you, do you have back pain from this? She was like, yes. Why doesn't anybody talk about that? Nobody ever warned me of the back problems I was going to have yeah. or the fact that after your surgery, you can't raise your arms. So if you have an itch, it's, you're like bringing the itch to your hand, you know? So I tell everybody, if you're, if you know somebody that's getting a mastectomy, get them a back scratcher. It's going to be the best thing that they've ever gotten in their entire life. Cause then you can, you know, scratch your head or whatever. Um, but there's so many little things that doctors don't know because they haven't been through it. Yeah. So I think it's important for the patients to really speak out and help each other through the process. That's crazy. Um, while this is all happening, so this is three years ago now mm -hmm. for context, um, you're not only, uh, I don't like the word I'm, I'm starting to dislike the term photographer because people, uh, people in our, in our uh, need to box everybody into something, we, we kind of have a very singular idea of what something means, but you, right. you are a photographer, but you're also an author. You are an mm -hmm. educator, a public speaker. You're a Nikon ambassador. The, mm -hmm. the list goes on and on. This is going on in the midst of all of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I stopped using the term photographer. You want to know what I call myself? Please tell me. I'm a photographer therapist. A photographer. <laughs> that is far more accurate. <laughs> that is what I do. I am not a therapist, but what I do has a very therapeutic aspect to it. Um, my friend, do you mind flipping your hair to the other side? So oh my you're, gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're totally good. Oh, I think that's the other side. You're, right? you're spouting gold here. I want to make sure the gold is not covered yeah. by bronze. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I'm a photographer therapist. So what I do, I, I, I have a very, it's a very therapeutic thing that I do. It's not, yes. I'm not a therapist, but, uh, in some ways I am with my camera. I, so I would a hundred percent agree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the, I've, I had a lot going on at the time, but it's good. It was good for me, I think. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm hundred percent sure that it's made you who you are, uh, in the sense of like going through something like that can only make you better at every single aspect of what you do. Um, at the same time, there's almost a sense of irony in this, in this kind of fate, because you're in being a boudoir photographer. Um, I know that you are like, when you say you're a photographer therapist, you are taking people in the way that they see themselves and you're rebuilding their self image and you're taking the best parts of them. You're emphasizing those pieces. You're, you're showing them who they can essentially be. You're rebuilding them, mm-hmm. um, yeah. in the form of, of an image. And the way that somebody transforms from that, um, is very unique and it's, I don't know that there's another area of photography that has that impact, um, especially Mm -hmm. because in boudoir, you're removing the skin. So what you see is just the self, just the person, or you're not not removing the skin, (laughs) removing, (laughs) removing the clothes, (laughs) you're removing the skin. I have no clients ever again. (laughs) In this cannibalistic form of boudoir. (laughs) Um, so, but then at the same time, you had a giant piece of your identity removed from you and how did that, I mean, your job is to rebuild others in their image and your image has just been torn down amidst mm-hmm. all of this. What, what is that like? Yeah. The irony is pretty crazy, isn't it? It's <laughs> um, like when it happened, I was like, I don't, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I'll say a couple of things about it. The first thing is it's hard for me. Sometimes it is hard. There are certain moments where women might come in and they complain about their body or they say, Oh, this is my boobs are so saggy. And I, and there is that little voice inside me. That's like, stop complaining about your boobs. You know, like, you know what I wouldn't do yeah. to kill to have my own boobs back. But what I realize is, um, that's a very little voice that I'm able to shut up pretty quickly because the truth is I actually think that being a boudoir photographer prepared me for this in the way that I have seen over the years, so many women go through so many things in their bodies and, you know, they come in and they say, I don't go to the beach because I have stretch marks. And I'm like, stretch marks, who's seeing your, like, where are these stretch marks that you're so, you know, cause one person said to this girl once, Oh my God, you have a stretch mark. It's ruined her entire life. Yeah. You know, um, or people say, Uh, you know, I have the scar from the surgery and I just, I want to hide it or whatnot. What I've learned over the years is that people don't see that stuff. And in fact, they love you not in spite of it, but because of it, because of the struggles that you go through. And I, and I've learned that women, any woman walking down the street that you can look at and say, wow, she's beautiful. She's perfect. She's thinner than me. She's prettier than me. Doesn't mean she's not going through stuff or feeling a certain way. So, you know, it is ironic that I photograph women, um, in this way. And, and I struggle quite often with my body image and, and who am I with my breasts like this and whatnot, but it also helps me. The therapy goes two ways, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I help them, but they also help me. And I've learned so much from them. And, you know, um, I'll just tell you a really, really fast story. We have time. Um, you don't need to make it fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll t- I, I tend to be verbose, so I will be less <laughs> verbose. But um, right before, so the January before I was diagnosed, um, a photographer in the area had called me. I don't, I don't know her well, or I didn't know her well at the time. And she said, um, you know, we had, a, we had a, a mutual friend, actually, who you know, who named her horse after you. Do you know my friend Amanda? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> she did so name her horse after me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we have a mutual friend and this mutual friend had just turned 30 and was diagnosed with cancer. And, oh and you know, she said, Oh, you have to call Jen. Jen will get you in. So she called me and she said, listen, I'm having a mastectomy at the end of this week. Cause it happens fast. You find out you have cancer and they're like, what are you doing Tuesday? You want, you're ready to do this. And you're like, yeah. wait, what? So she said, I really want to take photos before I have the surgery. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll fit you in somewhere. And I, I fit her in and I can't explain it, but something about that interaction with her, just like, I couldn't stop thinking about her. I couldn't stop thinking about what is it like to know you have to take your breasts off? What, how do you put yourself on that table and get rolled into an operating room? Mm -hmm. What do you do in the last moments? You know, how do you say goodbye to your breasts? How do you like, I I just like kept ruminating on the thoughts of what, what that, what that must be like. Um, 
And she asked me how much I charge. And I said to her, listen, I'm not going to charge you. I just want you to pay it forward one day. Just, mm-hmm. just come in. We'll take some shots. I just pay it forward one day. So when I was diagnosed, she was the first phone call I made. And I said oh, to her, wow. no, you don't know me well, but I have no idea what to do, where to go, what doctor to see. And she paid it forward to me. She put together a whole binder and got me you know, in touch with doctors and um, gave me a whole bunch of stuff that I needed after my surgery. And it was just such a unique um, experience to exchange that with her and you know we're close and we help each other through things um that's the power of what i do it's not just about how can i heal them they sometimes without even knowing help heal me and sometimes knowingly they help heal me so it's a beautiful relationship yeah that's that's pretty wild in many many aspects but on top of all of that, on top of the, you know, we, I only mentioned the career side, but then you're also a mother, uh, um, mm-hmm. a, a wife, you have your home life, you have all those different pieces going on. And, and I, <clears throat> I, I, I constantly talk about the strength of women because I, I'm, I'm honestly amazed by it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was one of those examples where I was like, I don't, I don't understand. There's, I had another conversation on, on one of our episodes, um, where it felt like in recent years, I've, I've come to feel like there's certain terms that are so completely backwards, you know, using the term pussy to describe somebody who's weak <laughs> is so completely backwards. Like we should be using dicks to describe people that are weak. <laughs> um, and like, like the, the way that our terminology, like you throw like a girl, but like to do anything like a woman, maybe it, it takes seeing your own spouse going through things, um, to, to realize it. I don't, I don't know what it is, but, um, I watched my, my partner have a baby, take care of three kids all at the same time. And then Mm -hmm. to, she also works full time. She like, she wakes up exhausted. Some days she's sick and she just continues to go and do the things that she does breastfeed Mm -hmm. each day. You know, you, you are, you're carrying the baby the entire time. You're also exercising. You're also, and there are things that like when, when guys, and this isn't just lip service, like seriously, when, when I'm sick, I'm like, Oh, I don't want to get out of bed. Oh, you get like, the man cold. Yes. It's like this. <laughs> and I, and I, I feel like I'm actually pretty decent about it where like, I will get up and still move and do things and get my work done. But I got yeah. friends that are like, these guys are the definition of the new dick, like where they're just right. like the weakest. They get a little, I'm not, I'm tired. I don't want to go yeah. for a bike ride. <laughs> like that kind of like mentality. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, how do we get to this place where yeah. the terms that we use are so backwards and our understanding of the sexes is completely backwards. Um, but anyway, that, that's kind of a, a side note. So, so now yeah. you have a podcast, you yeah. have a book, you're an author, you have shamelessly feminine that is, that is, so my podcast is called Shamelessly Feminine. Okay. It's for a kick-ass woman who needs a kick in the ass. It's S-F-A-F, right? <laughs> is Correct. That shamelessly yeah. Feminine as F? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I ha- I will say I have put that podcast on hold um, through the pandemic. I put it on hold a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if I'm bringing it back, but it does still exist out in the world. And all everybody that's been on that podcast is still super relative and awesome. And I highly suggest checking it out. I do think in uh, 2021, I'm going to be starting a cancer podcast. So Crazy. stay tuned for that. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to have you back on fun. to announce that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you also have a book too, right? I do. Tell us about that. It's, it's called, I won't drop the F bomb, but there is an F bomb in the title. <laughs> <can> drop the <laughs> <F-bomb>. <laughs> okay. I don't know how G rated we're supposed to be here. It is called what the fuck just happened. A survivor's guide to life after breast cancer. And, um, you know, to answer your question or that you didn't even ask, but I'm going to say this because I know you're going to ask, uh, but it, 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 it's relative to what you were saying about doing all the things while I was going through treatment. Um, you know, when, when you're in survival mode, and this is true for any person, when you're in survival mode, you put one foot in front of the other, you don't think about, am I going to die? What is this going to do for, you know, how is this going to affect me? Whatever it might be, you say, okay, today I got to get up. I have to do what I have to do. You know, I had chemo every other week. So on my chemo weeks, I kept my schedule very light on my off weeks. I 
busted butt. I went to the gym, I traveled, I worked, I did anything that I could do within my capacity to make me feel normal. Because at that time you just want some sort of normal. Yeah. Um, the problem is this is one of the things that nobody tells you that I found out the hard way that you're going to feel, not that you feel good during treatment, but you're going to feel really powerful. You're going to feel like I got this, I'm a warrior and people come and they support you and they cook dinners and they carpool your kids around. And, you know, they're like, Jen, go Jen, you're the best. You're so strong. You're amazing. And then your treatment ends and all of a sudden everyone's gone. Yeah. And you're supposed to just slip back into your regular life. Yeah. And you're like, wait a second. I can't slip back into my regular life. I am now a square peg trying to get into a round hole. And especially when you're a uh, part of a family and the family is just like, okay, good. Mom's back. Let's just get back to normal now. But you're not the same person. And so what happens is there's this tidal wave of what the fuck just happened to me. And, and I mean, there's a reason why I named the book that I sat there for hours thinking about what should the title be? And I just kept thinking, well, what did I think after this was all done? And I just kept thinking, what the fuck just happened? What just happened? Did I really cut off my breasts? Did I really have chemotherapy? Did I do all of that? And it hit me way after it hit everybody else. So while my family and my loved ones had processed it and dealt with it, I was first just starting to deal with it when it was over. And I'm still dealing with it in a lot of ways. It's taken quite a bit of time, but I can tell you that I have never had a suicidal thought in my entire life. I, you know me well enough to know I'm a pretty happy, upbeat person. Um, I have a lot of energy. I finished, um, my treatment on December 27th, which I just realized went came and went and I didn't even remember, which is so crazy. That's like a, that's a good thing actually. Uh, December 27th, I finished treatment and I was like, okay, the new year is going to be great. And, uh, January, it was like January 8th or so I flew to Vegas after my treatment to speak at CES for Nikon. And I was like, good, I'm done. Look, I'm getting back to work. It's amazing. And I came home and by January 21st, I think it was, I called my doctor and I said, I'm going to kill myself today. You're kidding me. I swear. I talk about it in the book. You know, I had, I had started, um, tamoxifen, which is a medication, uh, my, my cancer was estrogen fed. So most women who have estrogen fed cancer go on a medication that stops the cells from absorbing any estrogen, any of your cells. So it's like, it's terrible. It's a, it's a, it screws up your body in a lot of ways. Let's just put it that way. And one of those ways can be suicidal thoughts. And I just, I called her, I was two weeks on the medication. And I said, I am not kidding. I am like laying in bed for six hours crying. I've never done this in my life. And I'm going to kill myself today if you don't do something about it. And she was like, okay, well, stop taking the medication. (laughs) Let's start there. You know, don't kill yourself. Let's, that's the next step. And let's see how you feel in a week or two. I mean, thankfully it helped. I had to go back on. I went on and off until it was like the right time until my body could handle it. But, um, I don't think it was just the medication. You know, it was just uh, a feeling of, Oh my God, I I don't know where I belong. I don't know who I am. Oh, I'm getting emotional talking about it. Um, I don't know how to interact with the people that are in my life that supported me. They don't understand me. Um, everybody would say things like, well, you're good now, right? You're okay now. Right. And all I wanted to say was, no, I'm, I'm not good. I'm not good at all. But when you say that the response you get is you should be happy you're alive, be happy you're alive. People die from this. You know, you beat this, you should be exuberant. So then you shut down. You don't tell people how you feel. You go, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. You know, you do that whole thing. And inside you're just dying. You're just like, I I can't live like this. I feel horrible. And you feel selfish for not being grateful. Um, But in the book, I say, you know, there's a difference between feeling alive and being alive. And I can certainly tell you that even though you're alive after treatment, it takes time to feel alive again. It really does. I mean, you put poison in your body for 16 weeks, <laughs> literally trying to kill you. And people think you're just going to like be done and snap back. And, and nobody says, no, it's going to take time. Or you, you might want to invest in some therapy or you might not, you know, you might see your relationships a little differently or whatnot or life differently. So it's a very messed up time after treatment. Yeah. And I, I often feel like people, um, I don't even know if I would say that it's, it's out of good intention. <laughs> I mean, like, People have a really hard time just listening, uh, friends, family, everybody. Um, we all just have a, a generally a tough time listening without interjecting. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I want to say it's like good intention, but in general, I think it more so has to do with them just not wanting to hear it. Like they don't, it, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult to listen to. And so they, they, uh, they offer these insights that are not insights at all. And it just, it ends up, you, you just be quiet. Um, but oddly, I, I, <laughs> it's funny because you put a completely different perspective on me. I wrote, um, of one of the components of a successful relationship in the, in this book that I wrote is change and growth. And one of the things that I added to that subject, as I said, generally change and growth is something that occurs over time. It's the small everyday things that you're doing that leads to, uh, individual change and personal growth, which we have to consciously share with those that we want to keep close. Um, and I put in a note and said, it's worth noting that extreme events, traumatic events will speed up that process. Um, so, and I gave an example of, of kind of war, like coming back Mm -hmm. from war and the PTSD that, that like basically going and, and, and living a life where every day, this is exactly what you did. And you would describe it as war. You went and you fought Mm -hmm. and every day of your life was survival until one day suddenly you wake up and now it's about which cereal you know should i get at the grocery <laughs> right, store right 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 and it's like the most kind of convoluted effed up transition ever uh, of like how do you go from that back um I don't know how to understand it. I, I, I don't think I've been through, I, I've been through my own divorce, which was traumatic. And there was, there was moments of that in there. Um, but not to that level of, of extreme of like fighting for my life each day, whether you're going to war, whether you're battling cancer. Um, so I can't imagine that change in growth. Like, can you, can you describe some of it? What are the, what is the shift in outlook and that, that, that growth that you experience from this process? Yeah. You know, the, the things that were important before became way more important and the things that were less important became way less important. Yeah. Um, I, there certain toxic relationships that you were like, Oh, I don't know. Should I keep this friend? Should I not keep this friend? Just died. You know, like I just didn't even have patience or time or energy to deal with it. Um, I made new friendships that, you know, people came out of the woodwork, heard that I was sick and they, they came to support. They said, I don't know you, but I, I know enough that, you know, we're neighbors and I want to support you. And they've become some of my closest friends to this day. Um, the change is, I'll tell you this, the change in a lot of areas were, was very dramatic and a lot of areas, um, was not as dramatic as I wish it were. And I think that that's partly my holding on to like, still, I want to be that person that I was before cancer sometimes, you know, not that I, I don't know how to explain Tell me what you mean by that. Not that I want to be her because I I actually think that I'm way more awesome after cancer, by the way. For sure. I I would agree. I feel kind of comfortable saying that, but, um, it's very difficult when you look at photos, for example, I'm definitely going to get teary here, but when you look at photos of yourself before you're sick or before any traumatic event. Like, I don't recognize the person in those photos. You know, like I, I legit go, oh, is that me? Yeah. I don't recognize who she is anymore. And, but there's oftentimes I'll ruminate and I'll look through old photos and I'll say, oh, look how good my chest looked there. Or look at, that was a girl that didn't have to worry about cancer. You know, the minute you're diagnosed with cancer, your entire life changes for the rest of your life. And I, and I want to be fair and say that my cancer... Um, I'm very lucky, not good, that my cancer wasn't life-threatening in the moment. It was pretty far along, but I was very lucky that it didn't spread anywhere else and it was treatable and whatnot. There's also a little bit of a survivor's guilt of like some people find it too late and, you know, people will say to me, well, it could be worse, right? That's my favorite line ever. It could be worse. Okay. So, uh, and it could be, it could be, but, uh, the point is that there's, there's really two people that are living this lifetime of mine, the before cancer Jen and the after cancer Jen. And there are times where I long for the before cancer Jen, even though she wasn't as badass, she doesn't know herself as well as I know myself now. There are moments where I just miss that uninhibited life that cancer didn't fuck up. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I don't know how else to say it. Cause I think about it every day, you know, and I have to think about it every day because I have to get dressed. I have to look in the mirror. I have to, you know, I touch my body. I, you know, every little thing that you do 
reminds you of it or is it is a thought about it, you know? And so I miss that. I miss a life without cancer in it. But I don't want to be that person anymore. <laughs> you know, so it's like a weird, it's a weird paradigm. And it and it's I think it takes you some time to also come into your own skin as the person you are after cancer. I'm still working on that. I, you know, that's not something that happens quickly. No, I, I, I can imagine. And I, I also feel like I, so I've had, you know, an ACL reconstruction and an Achilles, you know, uh, reconstruction for torn ligaments, but those aren't things that are not only are they not as traumatic to, to go through, but those aren't things that I also have to stare at every day. I'm reminded of them on occasion when I go and do something sports wise and, and like, I feel a little bit of extra soreness there, but I don't think about it. Like I, <laughs> it's not as if I'm changing. And as soon as I, you know, take my shirt off, I'm like, Oh yes, mm -hmm. there it is. Um, so I, I think that's difficult to, for anyone that hasn't gone through it, I think it's difficult to wrap our heads around the only thing I can say is, um, it's worth listening to. It's an, it's incredible to hear your, your experience on this. I, I want to ask what was the impetus in like, like what was your, you, you had reconstruction surgery to build back your breasts. And, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, how is that? I, I guess what made you want to do that? Well, I was very afraid of what I would have to deal with emotionally if I didn't. I see. Um, first of all, second of all, um, I was afraid that it would scare my children. Like I felt like if I could at least look normal from the outside, then they would be okay. Then I wouldn't have to answer questions and I wouldn't have to be faced with it if I didn't want to be faced with it. And I wouldn't have to, um, I don't want to say question my femininity, but it was, it was partly that I, I felt like I was losing a lot of my femininity, that maybe it would make me feel more whole. Yeah. Um, has it, I'm not sure to answer that. I don't really know. I think so. I think that, um, I enjoy having them. They don't feel like mine. They feel like accessories, you know, they are, um, uncomfortable, but I, I feel like, and I was going to say this before, when you go through a process like this, if you look good, then everybody else is comfortable. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was always about making everybody else comfortable, managing other people's emotions, you know, in a lot of ways where, you know, like I saved my hair, I did cold capping. So it's like, you put this thing on your head and it freezes your scalp so that the chemo doesn't get to your scalp. So in, in essence, it's supposed to save your hair. I, I lost about 30% of my hair, but nobody really noticed because I had a lot of hair and people would say, oh, but you look good. And it would be like, well, Jen's not that sick because she has her hair. You know, yeah. she doesn't look like a cancer patient. So I kind of felt like the breast implants were an extension of that, but also it's really just a matter of wanting to feel like myself, wanting to look more like myself. Um, but it's hard because it's, it doesn't look, it doesn't look natural. It looks, let me put it this way. Cause I'm in love with my plastic surgeon. Um, he's amazing. And it looks as good as it can possibly look. But if, if anybody, like when people say to me, oh, in my boob job, this happened. I'm like, no, 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 this is not a boob job. This is like a completely different situation. You know, yeah. I have no natural breast tissue. My breasts feel like, you know, beach balls. I mean, there's no natural anything. I don't have feelings. I don't have nipples. I mean, I, it just doesn't, I look like, you know, a Barbie doll. I mean, I wish, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I look yeah, like, no. a, you know, it's, it's like a mannequin. I look like a mannequin, you know? So I think when I'm in clothes, it makes me feel, um, a little bit more like myself, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. You know, sometimes people say to me, do you ever see yourself maybe just taking them out and going flat and being done with it? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not there. I'm not there right now. I, I think that I see women that are flat that have flat, re, you know, closure. And I think that they're so fucking badass. Like, I'm like, you are so badass and so beautiful and so amazing. I just don't know mentally if I could be there yet. The boob envy is like a real thing. It's like a real thing. Yeah. I mean, guys definitely know that piece of it, at least the, the penis envy side, but <laughs> <laughs> so much of, um, it's, it's an odd thing because so much of our identities are wrapped up in the way others see us. 
Um, and so I can imagine that, you know, having the surgery and having your clothes on, there's a sense of normalcy that's brought back to your life. Um, until you're reminded once again in the mirror of, yeah. you know, so it, 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 uh, it's odd because it's so much of that need. And, and, and I, I understand that need because I spent a good portion of my life making decisions based around what other people thought, mm -hmm. uh, including my failed marriage. Yeah. Um, so I can, I can see the side of like, if, if society saw femininity as something else, if society saw femininity as, as a strength, mm -hmm. as you know, the, the, the pieces that it truly is, then I'm curious if that need would be there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, I talk about this exact thing in the book. I have a chapter about femininity and I essentially what I say in the book is that I've really had to rediscover my femininity. And I, when I sat down and made a list of, you know, I started to think about all the women that I look up to and all the trailblazers in the world. And, you know, what do I find feminine about them? What, what defines their femininity to me? And when I made the list, what I realized was it wasn't one physical attribute on there. No. There wasn't like, oh, she's beautiful. She's big chested. She's this, it's, you know, she's strong. She's a trailblazer. She was a good mom. She, you know, whatever it might be. So I have really learned that my identity as a woman is not tied up in my breasts. In fact, I think that they're more tied up in my scars than my actual breasts or any other part of my body. I'm very proud of my scars. Um, I show them off, obviously. I, I really love them. I don't hide them. Um, but I don't know. There's still something about the world we live in where clothes are made for women with breasts. Uh, bathing suits are made for women with breasts. Um, life is made for women with breasts. And when you don't have them, it feels, I don't know. For me, it just doesn't feel right yet. You know, it might one day. I don't know. Yeah. But for me, it was, um, I don't know. It was important for me at the time. Yeah. And it still is, I guess, because I just had a surgery two and a half weeks ago. So I guess it is still important to me. But, you know, I think also sometimes how we look correlates with how we feel. And so it's not just about how other people perceive me, but it is very much like, you know, all right, listen, I went through two re reconstruction surgeries before I found my current plastic surgeon. And my, my breasts were very, they were low in the wrong place. They were really low. They were really far apart. I looked like it was all deformed. It was not a good situation. When I had my first surgery with this doctor and, and everything was put in the right place and I had a little bit of cleavage, which I hadn't seen in so long. And I took off my bandages and I saw cleavage. I just bawled. And it wasn't about the sexual side of cleavage or the sensual side or the feminine side of cleavage. It was just, oh my God, for a second, I recognized that person in the mirror. There yeah. she is, you know? You see the person that you, you knew. Yeah, that's a, it's a powerful and, and not, not something that I can kind of wrap my head around other than yeah. just to listen to. But now in, in seeing that, uh, how does that, that, that has to make you that much more powerful, more effective at every single thing that you you do from whether it's photographing a client to communicating, to writing, to conceptualizing, to empathizing. Yeah. I'll tell you this. It's helped me through this pandemic. Like you wouldn't believe, I think I might be the last person standing that is like, I'm good. <laughs> you know, like this is fine because I, I feel like, um, everything I do now I feel is a gift to me, you know? Um, I can't always do the things I love to do before. I used to love doing push-ups and pull-ups and work out at the gym. And I can't do a lot of those things anymore, mm -hmm. um, you know, because of the surgeries. But like if I'm in a moment, for example, in the gym and I'm struggling and it's hard and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so grateful that I get to be here and do this. I'm going to do this, if not for me, for somebody who can't be here today. Because all those days that I was sitting in that chemo chair and I would have rather have been at the gym, you know, yeah. I was like, please stop complaining to me about your stupid, that you have to go to the gym, please. Yeah. You know, like I would die to do that. Um, I, you know, anytime I'm struggling in a shoot, anytime I'm struggling in my business or there's a pandemic or you know, relationship issues, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point. I, 
just, I have these built in reminders. <laughs> They're called yeah. scars that I've done harder things. And I, I often say that to myself, you've done harder things than this. What are you complaining about? <laughs> you know, what, why do you have this self doubt that you can't do something you have done harder things? Um, so that's kind of where I go with that. Well, I mean, before the cancer, I would have said you already can wear that badge of honor as, as far as like have done harder things after the cancer, uh, you might as well be a medal of honor recipient. Um, this is, it, 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 it takes a lot. So I can see where I can imagine, let me, let me say it that way. I can imagine having gone through something like that. Um, so many of the prior relationships, the prior interactions, the prior everything, how do you give a shit about any of it? Like, <laughs> because yeah. How do you, I mean, in what way, in what way? I mean, we have this way of kind of, you know, oh my gosh, it's leg day. I really don't want to go to leg day. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. we have this way of kind of dramatizing almost everything that we're going through almost, almost to a, in 2020, it's got so incredibly unhealthy that like, I, uh, I, you, you saw me at one point do something that was very out of character in one of our online groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was like the first, I, I, I think of myself as a pretty controlled person. And when mm -hmm. I did that, and then after the, like the whole, after the fact, I was like, that is not who I am. And that is not like, mm -hmm. you know, what I am. And it was making an issue out of something that is so trivial and so stupid and just like, why are we doing this? But that's, that is 2020 in a nutshell mm -hmm. is nobody has anything better to do. We're all dealing with a bunch of shit. So let's just make little fires everywhere. And, and, and it's just like, everyone has all the time. We're all stuck at home. So look at all the fires we can make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't do that. But there's so many relationships in, in that I know personally in my own life mm -hmm. where it's like, you, you give time and you give energy to these things that just don't matter. Like, mm -hmm. and people that are stuck in these things that just don't matter. Yeah. Perspective. Yeah. And so when I say like, I didn't do that, I don't mean that in a judgmental way. What I meant no, no, no. was, um, what I mean by that is there's a, there's a perspective here that, that I have that might be different than other people who have not gone through something like I've been through. Um, I could fairly say that when this is over, we've all been through something like I've been through, right? We're all sort of collectively going through this trauma right now. The whole world is going through it. So I would just say that, um, boundaries are something that I have really learned a hell of a lot about through yeah. my cancer journey. And, um, I have, I am really careful about putting boundaries up about things that are important to me and things that are not important to me really fall by the wayside really do. And just, and also really being empathetic and holding space for people. I mean, we didn't talk about it, but when I saw that happen, my first instinct was, Oh, I hope he's okay. Mm -hmm. This is out of character for him where somebody else might say, what a dick, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I'm glad he's not here anymore. I'm gonna, whatever. I'm, I'm sure you know, people, plenty um, of people said that. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know what they said, <laughs> but I'm just saying <laughs> that, um, you know, we are very, very, as a society before this pandemic, through the pandemic and everything quick to judge people. Um, I always say that, you know, I have this expression in my business, shed your clothes, shed your inhibitions. Right. Mm -hmm. So you and I could, if you didn't know me, we could have had this whole conversation. And if I didn't say anything about breast cancer, you would never know. True. But if I was sitting here without a shirt on, you would see my scars. You would see my bruises. You would see my medical bra that I'm wearing right now, keeping, you know, my compression bra, whatever. And you would say, oh, what's going on with you? You know, are you okay? Yeah. And we would, we would match each other at a deeper, deeper level. So I remember after my first surgery, my mastectomy, and I went to my appointment in the city and I was walking down the city streets and, and there was, it was really crowded. It was lunchtime. And if anybody had banged into me, I would, I would have just dropped. I was like, so scared someone was going to bang into me. And I just was like banging into people like, you know, just so that they wouldn't bang into me, you know, like don't touch me. And I, they probably all thought I was a jerk, but they have no idea what's going on. Yeah. So I always try to remember that what we see on the outside 
you know, I'm not just talking about clothes. <coughs> I'm talking about people's attitudes, people, you know, cutting you off on the road or giving you an attitude or giving you lip or falling apart. It's like, you really don't know what's going on with that person. And we could easily judge or we can say, are you okay? And then that's really how relationships are formed, right? That's really like that first step to an intimate understanding of each other. It's interesting that 2020, I I personally thought that when, when everything kind of began, that it would take us down that road where everybody would be able to better empathize with each other. It, yeah. it feels like we've gone the very much opposite end where not only can we not empathize, we can't agree to disagree. We can't share differing opinions. We can't, we can't even let people be nuanced in the way that they think. If you are Republican, you are racist. If you are Democrat, mm-hmm. you are, you know, a uh, liberal left. If you are, mm-hmm. It, it was weird. I mean, like to have collectively gone through something traumatic and yet to come out the other side more calloused and mm. lacking of empathy is an odd thing. Yeah. I don't get involved in any of those conversations. That's the stuff that I'm talking about where it's yeah. like, I believe what I believe. I'm open to hearing what other people believe. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. I'm happy to educate myself, but to get into petty bullshit, it's like, really? Is that how you want to spend your time? And I said this from the very beginning, I did a video about this on my YouTube channel. Who do you want to be at the end of this pandemic? Because you only have one shot to get it right. And I think that, um, you know, nobody really understood that it was going to last this long. I kind of did. I, I compared it to cancer the whole way. I mean, I gave up a good year to two of my life to cancer. Right. Um, and I thought to myself, this is the same thing. We're going to give up a year or two it's going to be different, but then we'll find a new normal after and things will get, they will be okay again at some point. They will be, um, when that is, I don't know, but you know, patience is a virtue, I guess. So I just don't, I just, I shut it out. I'll stop listening to the news or I'll stop checking Facebook. Um, you know, it's hurt my business in a way because I I haven't gone on Facebook in quite a while, you know, really to do stuff that I would normally do because I just could not see, have that toxicity seep into my life. And I'm very careful about that. The toxicity for me is really important to keep away. And um, it's just decisions, you know, and, and unfortunately, people are bored. People are bored of this. People are um, irritable. You know, yeah. things rub the, it's, we're all kind of just walking around with open wounds. And if somebody just pokes you the wrong way, that's it. You just, you get the wrath of somebody. And, um, I just wish more people would take the opportunity to be more introspective during this time and learn more about themselves versus lashing out on others. Yeah. It's, uh, I have to say this year has been surprising on so many levels. Uh, mm-hmm. one of those has also been uh, the emotional reactions of everybody has been one, the other side of it is to see the economy booming from the stock market side while right. everything is collapsing on like none right. of it, none of it makes what sense. What is going me. on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I know this when I went through, you know, what was interesting to me uh, when I went through my divorce, the divorce to me wasn't necessarily the traumatic part. Um, you know, uh, you shared a lot and I'm, I'm an open book as well. So I will share, I, in that process, I lost everything. Like, Mm. um, I had, you know, the better part of a million dollars in savings that all went to my ex. It was, it was just to buy back my ownership in my own business, which, Mm. you know, my ex never spent any time in that. And, and the law doesn't actually look at who does what in a relationship. So despite the fact that, you know, at home, it was me and mother mostly kind of running the home, her mother. Um, mm-hmm. The law doesn't step in to say like who does what. Right. But I was okay with that. I was okay with losing all of that um, and rebuilding. Uh, the The divorce itself didn't feel traumatic. The nasty things that were done, those were easy to kind of brush over and say, you know, this person's not in a good place and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and move on. Like put my energy in better places. Mm-hmm. The hardest part for me was so much of who I was, was wrapped into my identity, uh, my, my religious identity Mm -hmm. and so much of why I stayed 
in the marriage for 15 years was wrapped up in that religious identity. And Mm -hmm. that was the piece for me that it was like trying to rediscover myself and saying, am I still the same person? Um, if I'm not, you know, if I don't practice being Mormon anymore, am I still me? Is this, Mm -hmm. you know, am I just completely somebody else? Um, am I a bad person? Am I, you know, all these things, am I a failure? And it was trying to put the pieces of that back together after all of it. And when I put the pieces back together, I found that religion had no place in this new puzzle. Mm. Um, but it was odd because it was like, it had always been there. It had always been Mm. such a, it, it was a central piece of, so as you were describing the process, I was thinking to myself, you know, you're describing being feminine and being a woman and what that means and to have a central piece of that taken away. The only, the only slightly relatable thing I can, I can think about was I built my life around God and this religion. And that was like, it was difficult. That was, that was the piece that I honestly, it, that was what I was grappling with for 15 years. It wasn't, it wasn't divorce. It wasn't whether this is a healthy relationship or not. I I spent all this time trying to make it work because that was my central piece. And it was at what point, how far am I willing to go before I'm willing to reevaluate what I've built my identity on? I think, first of all, I want to applaud you because that is so difficult. And I, if I will share a little bit of some experience of that in my own life, if you're open to it, but I I want to just say that, um, there's so much freedom in truth. Yeah. You know, there is so much freedom and health and happiness in being honest with yourself and truth. That's really something that I've learned quite a bit through this journey. Um, the ability to be able to question everything I've ever thought to be true is one of the greatest pleasures of my life. I just had a, um, a conversation today with a friend, a deep conversation today about, um, marriage. And, um, I'm starting to notice that the, I'm going to age myself here, but the younger generations are starting to put like on Instagram that, you know, they're putting their pronouns fine. Great. Mm -hmm. And then they're putting their sexual orientation and I'm starting to see the sexual orientations are really like, there's a lot of them now, right? Like there's polyamorous, there's, um, non-monogamous, there's whatever it might be. And I was having a discussion with him about the fact that we have young children or his children are younger than mine that, you know, we have young children. And I said, you know, I think you're going to need to be, and he's very traditional, very, very traditional. I said, I think you're going to need to be open to the idea that your kids may not be in a traditional relationship and that might work. And that maybe this is a really good thing that we're learning this about people, because I think a lot of this has been going on. We just haven't labeled it. (laughs) You know, we haven't actually said it's okay. And, you know, we were having a conversation about, coming at it from a feminist point of view, like what is better for women? Is marriage better for women? Is marriage not better for women? Is it, you know, we were just having this very deep conversation about it. Yeah. Um, and he just kind of kept saying, no, I'm traditional. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. And I said, you know, I get that, but also like what a wonderful world it is that we can really question like the, what we've been taught to believe. And I was raised in a very traditional household also where marriage was absolutely non-negotiable. You stay in your marriage, you work it out, you go to therapy or you do whatever you have to do. And I will tell you, and it's not something I've really spoken about publicly quite yet, but I am going through a divorce right now. Um, I filed for divorce two months ago. Um, so I mean, if like infertility and, you know, cancer and (laughs) pandemic wasn't enough, we'll just add divorce to the mix. It's all good. You might as Um, well just Rip off you can handle aid. all of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do it all at once. Um, but I will tell you, I I really relate to what you said. Uh, you know, when I was first, um, the first time I told my parents that I was unhappy, and, sorry, the dog was acting crazy in my relationship. My mother's answer was, "Well, you have to make it work. You have children." Yeah. And I was like, I think that's the wrong answer, mom. You know, I think, sorry, Texi. <laughs> Texi, so on. cute. You're ruining the moment here. <laughs> um, that's always the first response. You mm-hmm. have to figure it out. You, you have, have to, to make it work. It this is for yeah. the children. This is what's best for the children. But you know what? I believed it. I really believed it. I yeah. really like it was in my blood. You know, it was, I always wanted to get married and be married forever. That was my goal in life. My goal was like, I want to be married 50 years. I want to have a huge 
you know, party for my 50th anniversary. I want to sit in a porch rocking in my rocking chair, holding hands with my husband at 98 years old, you know? Um, but I really believe that. And I'm going to be honest, I have judged other people unfairly when they get divorced, I would say, I would think to myself, well, they didn't work hard enough. They just have to yeah. work harder. They or just have so to and so more. cheated or, you know, right. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I, I would, and I remember even saying to my soon to be ex-husband, you know, I, you know, well, we're better than that. Right. We, we're good. We're healthy. We're good. You know? And the truth is that those beliefs stopped me from doing what I needed to do for a very long time. And that sucks. <laughs> You know what I mean? That sucks. So I really relate to to you. It's not necessarily a religious thing, but it is an upbringing. It is a morality. It, it was it was part of who I who I am, and I'm still struggling with it a little. I mean, I felt a lot of shame. I still haven't told a lot of people because there is sort of this underlying, like, what are they going to think? Are they going to not that I care what other people think, by the way? But I just don't want to have to answer to somebody about anything. Like, I don't want to have to explain anything to anybody. So my easier answer is I just won't tell anybody and it'll be fine. But there is, I think, a, a underlying level of the shame. I'm a failure. Did I fail at this? You know, um, it really screwed me up for a while. And I'm, I'm going to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I, I made the right decision. Let's put it that way. I made the right decision Yeah. for me and for my family. Um, I think that there comes a point in every relationship where you say, I'm going to stay for the kids. I'm going to stay for the kids. I'm going to stay for the kids. And then you start questioning, am I actually teaching the kids the right thing here? And I realized that my staying for the kids was doing exactly what my parents taught me stay for the kids. Although my parents have a great relationship. I don't want to make it sound like they don't, but it was like a, you have to stay for the kids. You have to stay for the kids. And I just thought to myself one day, I'm not teaching them the right thing here. I'm not showing them the right thing. I'm not leading by example. And that's really what changed my mind in the end. That was one of my pieces too, which was, um, I was repeating a generational cycle of, uh, it was, it was a, a cycle that had led me to exactly where I was, mm-hmm. um, not having good relationship examples in my life. Um, and it's such a funny thing because, you know, like if you ask children in their adulthood, you know, they, there's studies on this where they've, they've asked adults and said, you know, those adults who had childhood with parents that were unhappy, they've asked them and said, which would you have preferred Mm -hmm. the, as an adult, they always say, I, I, my parents should have gotten split up. Like they were not happy. And I, Mm -hmm. I just wanted them to be happy. And I know so many examples of people that have absolutely ruined their children staying in their marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, just as many, like, it's such a weird thing. I, I no longer, you know, when someone says I'm getting divorced, I, I, I generally don't say anything other than just listen. Uh, there's no, I'm sorry, because usually uh, more often than not, they're going to tell me something that is, is very justifiable. Like it's, this is, you know, honestly, the first response I, I want to say congratulations is my first response. <laughs> um, but then that would also be insensitive because I don't know the backstory. So now I just stay right. quiet when someone says I'm getting yeah. divorced, I just stay quiet. And then, but in so many cases, it's, uh, it's healthier for both people. And what I realized to myself was one of my biggest regrets was my children were about six years old. So my oldest was six. And I realized that from the time that he was born to the time that he was six, I wasn't the father that I wanted to be because I was preoccupied with just making things work. Um, So when I was home, I wasn't present when I was away, which was a lot because I didn't want to be home. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So looking back, I was like, how could this possibly be better than Mm -hmm. at least being a father, a good father, 50% of the time, if I have 50% custody, at least I can give my kids a good example 50% of the time that they're with me. How can that be worse than giving them a bad example 100% of the time? 100%. 100%. I too, I put so much energy into my relationship that um, I would never say, how do I put this? I'm I'm trying to be very careful about my words because this is is not over. You're um, totally fine. We could even save this for a, a future follow-up conversation if that's yeah. better. I mean, when this divorce is finalized, we're going to talk about it, but, um, <laughs> I, I think I'm teasing, but I think that, um, 
I do feel that my relationship with my children has gotten increasingly better, even though I'm only with them half the time at this moment. Um, That's weird, do, right? Isn't that odd? You know what? I, I, I think it's for multiple reasons. I think it's because I'm more present with them and they're, they want to be more present yeah. with me. Yeah. I think it's because we get a little break from each other. My kids are teenagers. For sure. They want a break from me, you for know, sure. <laughs> and like um, having a day or two off a week from them is okay for me too. You know, I prefer to be with them seven days a week, of course, but I'm just trying to make lemonade out of lemons here, you know? Um, yeah, I, I do. And you know what? I think that what's happening is we're all going through a trauma together. And so when that happens, there is a certain bonding that happens. And I do keep saying to them, you know, I got you, we are a team I'm in with you. And it's, it's helped us put some walls down. I mean, my kids have seen me cry. My kids have seen me. Uh, and you know, they have before we've discussed a lot of stuff through cancer, but yeah. the cancer didn't really apply to them. You know, they were younger. They didn't really understand. This really is changing their life too. And I just keep saying to them, Hey, we got through this. We can get through that, you know, or we got through that. We can get through this. Um, you know, we beat cancer. We can get through this divorce. We can, we can make this great. And I, and I do say to them flat out, a happy mom is a good mom, you know, and I'm, I'm happy right now. And of course this situation makes me sad. Um, but I, I am going to be very happy and you guys are going to be happy too. And I'm going to make sure of it, you know? So it's brought us closer together in a lot of ways. We've had a lot more intimate conversations. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things that you said earlier makes me think like it's, it's kind of this overarching problem that <laughs> honestly is the creator of every societal issue that we have, but it's this this need to be right or this unwillingness to be wrong. This, you, you said that there's freedom and truth and embracing mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I can't agree more with it. And I feel like it's exactly the unwillingness to like, to resist truths, to like resist mistakes that is causing everything like staying in a marriage for too long. That that's one thing, you know, like not, or getting married when you know you shouldn't, that's another, or, you know, just bad relationships in general. But beyond that, looking at like politics, like how refreshing would it be to hear someone say, um, Hey, it looks like you changed your mind on this subject. And mm -hmm. the person's like, yeah, you know what? I kind of fucked up. Um, I didn't have good information and I made a bad decision back mm -hmm. then. So now I'm in a different place and this is what I believe now. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Over. Right. You're free. And I'm gonna, like, I will up you one. Are you ready for this one? I'm ready. Okay. Cause there's a line in your book I want to read. Can I, can I refer mm -hmm. to your book? Okay. Yes. This is the first time on the podcast someone's <laughs> referenced the book. There's multiple lines actually that really resonated with me, but I, I, um, there was another one too. Let me see if I can find it, but, um, okay. This line maintaining unhealthy relationships comes at the cost of your own happiness, emotional well being, and even physical health. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <sighs> I often wonder to myself, you know, when you know the truth, when you, when you, sorry, this dog is very attention worry. I love texting. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> when you know the truth and you don't speak the truth, it gets stored somewhere in your body. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I often wonder if that's part of why I got breast cancer is because I was really suppressing a lot of truth for a very long time. Um, and not speaking my truth and not standing up for myself and not putting up boundaries in the way that I should have, uh, was very toxic to my body, I believe. And, you know, for me, that was also part of my decision. It's like, okay, if I'm going to clean up my life, if I'm going to have, you know, a healthy life, I have to be healthy emotionally. I have to be, you know, uh, in a, in a different position than I was in. And so that really resonated with me. And I, I think it's a very underrated thing. I think people will read a line like that and go, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it's like real. It's like a real thing, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. uh, and so I, you're not the first person, by the way, that has, yeah. I actually have someone else in my life that, uh, had cancer living almost the exact same, like basically just living a lie. Yeah. And she, she developed now the, these stories are, are 
anecdotal and I don't want people to think that there's, I don't think there's enough studies done on this side to, to know, but I, I'm with you. And the, that line actually comes from studies that demonstrate that those who are in negative and unhealthy relationships where they're essentially living a lie, there are studies that are done that their immune system responses are diminished mm-hmm. by somewhere in the range of like 20 to 30%. Yeah. So I was in, it was, it was a very odd thing to me Um, because I mean, denial can go so incredibly deep, right? Sometimes you don't even know you're in denial. (laughs) Yeah. You don't even know. I was getting sick, um, probably like once to twice a month Mm. for the last five years of my marriage. Um, I, when I came out of it, not only did uh, the first thing that I discovered was that I had, um, a gallbladder that was almost ruptured. Um, mm. so the first thing I, I needed was emergency surgery to get that fixed. Mm. Um, that was causing major, major issues. But the other side of it was just, as soon as I was done, I, I stopped getting sick. Now mm. I had read these studies when I was still in the marriage, but I still refused to believe it. Mm-hmm. Like I knew that this causes physical damage to me, mm. but I refused to accept it. Mm-hmm. But it's so dumb because if somebody told you you had an ulcer, what would you do? You'd be like, oh, I'm under so much stress. I need to stop being so stressed. I mean, for sure. we know that there's a mind body connection. We know that for sure. hundred percent. We all believe in it. We all get it. You know? So why is it when we have these traumas or heartbreaks or whatever it might be, and then they carry out a different physical manifestation that we're like, oh, I don't know, maybe, you know, like, no, there is a mind body connection. We all yeah. know this. It's a yeah. fact. The the most fucked up part is if you imagine, I mean, if you're in this situation um, and then you were to rephrase your story or your question for yourself, um, you're in this situation. Let's say, let's say I'm in this marriage. Um, I'm unwilling to leave it. Why? Because what God has, you know, made right, no man should put asunder and, and it's wrong to do this. And it's, so I am not going to leave this. I'm going to make it work, but had, and this was actually the, the kind of the keystone of like this whole, me giving myself permission to leave was when a friend actually said to me, he goes, if Ethan or Ellie were in a marriage like yours, what would you do? And I'm not kidding you, Jen. Like I, I responded so quickly. The first thing I said, I didn't even think about it. I said, run. Mm-hmm. And he goes, wait, what? And I go, run. I would tell them to run far, get away from this, be done with this. And he goes, why can't you love yourself yeah, enough to tell your, know. yourself yeah. that? Yeah. And, uh, and that was like the first time that I was like, okay, I'm going to make a decision for my own health. Mm-hmm. But that did it that, feel selfish? Did it oh, feel absolutely. selfish? It felt it's like that's, completely selfish. Yeah. I think as a mom, especially that's why I'm asking you. Cause I want the dad point of view. Like I can only have the mom point of view, you know, as a mom, I was like, I, this whole thing is only together because I'm holding it together. The minute I pull the plug, it's all falling apart, you know? And I felt so much guilt. So I still do sometimes so much guilt of like, this is all my fault, it's my fault, my fault, my fault. But you know, as time goes on and I'm seeing the other side a little bit, I'm like, Oh, it gets better like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. It gets better because then you, you start to give your kids the life that you wanted and you realize it is so dramatically different than what I was giving them before. So, yeah. but in the process, uh, you know, there, there aren't a lot of, I will say, uh, being a man, I'm not a white man, so I don't get every single privilege, but there are plenty of privileges as a man that I do get to appreciate. Um, one of them that we don't get to appreciate is, uh, in the divorce process, you are like, as the guy, I was the one asking for it. And so close friends, um, people that, you know, I knew at church, they were constantly accusing me of cheating. They were like, dude, like I had one of my, like someone I consider like family, he calls me up and he's like, don't lie, dude, just, just tell me the truth. Uh, you cheated. And I'm like, no, dude, like, I, I, I wouldn't do something like that. I'm, I'm not the kind of person to like, if I want to cheat, I will fix the problem or, or, mm-hmm. or divorce before going and doing that. I'm not going to go and do that just to 
right. skip over a step. But and is that because you hadn't spoken your truth for so many years? Like for you, it maybe was a long time in the making, but for other people, it was kind of sudden. Is that how it kind of happened? Probably. I mean, we all, once again, the problem with our entire fabric of society is Instagram is the epitome of what's wrong with our society. Like <laughs> everybody knows each other's highlight reel. Mm hmm. We all know each other's 1%. You know, that's what we're willing to put out there. And we do our damnedest to try and cover up every other piece of it. So, yeah, I, I didn't talk about this stuff. Everyone's got their own crap going on, so I never mm -hmm. talked about it. But it was unusual to me to be sitting there. And I remember, you know, I was I was pretty high up in, like, the the Mormon church organization. Um, I had served on this position of what, what was called the high council. Um, so I was mm -hmm. one of these, you know, people that would help administrate over multiple congregations. Mm -hmm. And I remember my, the, the president of the, the high council asked me when we were together, um, just be honest, brother, did you cheat? And he's like, this is what, ha this is, you know, what, why it's ending. Yeah. You, you cheated. And I was like, I've been here for years. Sir. Like, you right, know, me. you know who I am. You, yeah. Like, do you think I'm just, and it blew me away that it was like, in the process, everybody took sides. And that is the one time in life where I will say um, women and and probably by right, in most cases, you should side with the woman, but just by genetic disposition for men to go and do whatever they're going to do. Um, but there are also many cases where, you know, nobody's in the wrong. There's also many cases where, hey, someone, maybe the guy has tried any and everything possible mm -hmm. and it's just mm -hmm. not working and, and, and someone's making a decision, but everyone is kind of our, our tribalness comes out. We have to pick a side, you know, yeah. who are you with? Who do you stand with in this process? Like, yeah. Man. You know, it's, it's funny because I'll give you the, the opposite perspective. So, you know, I'm the one that asked for the divorce. Um, so I, I had a conversation with my therapist one day and I said, you know, I'm just like, we were talking about telling people and how I was so nervous to tell people because I didn't want them asking questions because I just didn't feel like, um, the reasons were really anybody's business. Yeah. And, uh, at least not at the moment. And she said, Oh, don't worry. Everyone's just going to think he cheated anyway. <laughs> You know, like, so you're saying it's, you know, that's, that's, so this is not just, this is a cross and I'm Jewish, right? So there you go. It's across the board. <laughs> it's across the board. Everyone just thinks you, there are many things that happen behind the scenes and I don't know it, you, you can't be an influencer though. Right. If you, uh, if you share all of it, <laughs> at least, well, I don't know because in, I, I mean, Right. Well, look, for me personally, I will tell you, I've never really shared uh, marital issues on social media platforms because of my children, sure. number one. Uh, and number two, out of respect for my husband, you know, I never, he didn't ask to be on my social media. You know, it for wasn't, sure. um, it's my social media. This is about Jen Rosenbaum, you know, not about the Rosenbaum family. This is not sure. what I do. Uh, the number one question I get actually, when I tell people that I'm getting divorced is, well, when are you going to tell Instagram, oh, wow. you know? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I will one day. Um, but not today, you know, not obviously while there's legal action happening and I'm not really sure what my kids want to be out there and not, I don't want to throw them under the bus. There's a lot of sensitive things. So for me, I'm talking about it with you because it feels like a safe platform to do so. Um, and I feel safe with you and with, even, I know a lot of people are going to listen to this. I feel safe with them. So nobody like runs my Instagram and be like, Hey, heard you're getting a divorce. But, um, you know, when something goes on social media like that, in that way, it's very hard to control the narrative. And I don't want to make it about my husband and the divorce. I want For it sure. to be about Jen and how Jen is going to come out of this on the other side and just another life experience that I have. Cause that's just what this is. And so I will post about it eventually and I'll talk about it a little bit, but it will not be a man bashing session. It will be, okay. I went through another one of life's troubles and this is how I feel about it. And this is, and, and listen, there's a whole other set of issues here for me, like thinking about dating with these weird foobs that I have, you know, like, is somebody going to love me if they know that I, I Did am. Did you just call them foobs? 
Yeah, foobs. That's foobs. a real term. Foobs, <laughs> okay. fake boobs. I just learned um, something. Yeah, it's foobs. Um, you know, is somebody going to want to date me? Is somebody going to find me attractive? Am I going to be comfortable with somebody, you know, seeing me this way? Um, there's another part of me that's like, this is the most amazing filter ever. You know, this will yeah. get all the jerks out of there. Um, you know, but there's a lot of issues there that relate to life, to femininity, to breast cancer, to, again, being a failure as a woman. Like I very much struggle with, I couldn't make this marriage work no matter how hard I tried. And let me tell you, I tried so hard for so long and I do feel like it's a failure, but I, I have to learn it takes two to tango, right? It's, um, it's not just on me, but I will talk about it, but it will be from my perspective, not a, you know, I'm not all into that. You know, my husband is, this, my husband did that. I, it doesn't matter that, you know, the details are just details. It's, it's really about how do you get through this? And it is also a fallout from my cancer in a way, you know, because I mean, I'll be honest, a lot of this stuff was going on before cancer, but when you go through cancer and you have to say to yourself, okay, I don't know. None of us know really how much time we have left here. How am I choosing to spend it? Yeah. That, That's a big question. That, uh, that's one of those change in growth pieces of like what you're doing. You kind of reevaluate and see what track you're on. And I don't, I, I think there's truly a, a, a time and place to talk about things. And there's a, there's a way to talk about things. And there's, um, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like anybody that goes anywhere just to bash their significant other, their friend, their whatever it is, I kind of immediately dismiss them as like the one that is at fault. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like if you're going to go publicly, like about, like without acknowledging your own F mm -hmm. ups, um, there, there in every conversation and every discussion, there should be some form of equal ownership. If not just to acknowledge the fact that you chose this, like you mm -hmm. chose to be there. Mm -hmm. The only tough part for me is that, and maybe this is part of this new wave of media. Um, I feel mm -hmm. like over the last few years, I've, I've really wanted to push back against the stupid, perfect sound bites, the, the short titles, the clickbaity subjects, the five tips on this, the perfect image. And I just want a place for authentic conversations. Like that's what this mm -hmm. is. I, I just mm -hmm. want a place to like actually share and, and, and be who I am. And I do see there's sort of a shift in a lot of people kind of wanting that same thing. Mm -hmm. Like let's stop with the, the, you don't have to talk about everything, but at the same time, do we all need to keep pretending that life is Instagram's, you know, highlight reel? Like, mm -hmm. like that's the part that, that, that aggravates me is like this. Yeah. And you almost, the people that are stuck in it the worst, they're almost the ones that are going at it the hardest. I, I don't have any scientific data for this, but I do have plenty of anecdotal data mm -hmm. where I have friends and people around me who I know are struggling in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And the more that they struggle in their personal life, in their relationships, in their marriages, in their business endeavors, the more they post inspirational messages and mm -hmm. quotes and mm -hmm. how great life they're is. They're looking for it themselves. They're looking for it themselves. Yes. It's, it's the good guy syndrome. I call it the good guy syndrome. So like, ha have you ever well met somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm a good guy. I'm such a good guy. I'm such a good guy. I'm like, you're the one I need to look out for. Because yeah. if you're a good guy, you don't need to tell me you're a good guy, buddy. You know, like, I'll just know you're a good guy. So it's, That's hilarious. It's, it's exactly that, you know, it's like, let me show you how great it is, how great it is, how great it is. I mean, I, I, listen, I used so to So it say, is noticeable like, then you, you oh see it too. God. Totally. Have you, I mean, I see it on my own page, by the way. And now that you all know that I'm getting divorced, you will see like, there's certain things that I posted that resonate with me in the moment. I'm not just posting it for you. I'm posting it for me too. You know, like I, that's my inspiration. It's resonating with me. So I'm going to post it. But, um, I always say like, do you ever, do you know, those couples that are like, they write to each other back when like Facebook was kind of cool. And they'd be like, baby, I love you. I just hope, I just wanted to say, have an awesome day. And I was thinking about you. I'm like, Oh, this couple's getting divorced. No doubt. I will put my house on it. You know, like no doubt, because if you have to go to Facebook to tell you, to tell somebody that you love them in that way, you're just trying to convince everybody else, you know, and convince sure. yourself, you know, otherwise like you can talk, talk to each other. You're probably laying next to each other, <laughs> writing on Facebook, you know, but yeah, that, that does exist. It's the good guy syndrome. Okay. 
I, that's what I call it. <laughs> Cause I've felt like a crazy person, like, like, Mm-mm. and, and almost in every single case, like three months or six months after all those, you know, posts and affirmations and inspirational, I'll reach out to them and, and, uh, we'll, ha- we'll connect again. And then I'll find out they just like went through some horrible stuff. And I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. There, there's another byproduct of this that that I don't think we think about or talk about is when when life is all roses, you kind of give your friends permission just to not really worry. Like if if that's actually what's going on, then I'm not really worried about, you know, things. But if you tell me something's up, then I'm going to be there and I'm going to make sure like you're you're good. But there's it's a this relationship need. blocker. It's a relationship blocker. It, it's simply a relationship blocker. When you cannot say to somebody, I need help, or I need an ear, or I just need a friend, or I'm not great right now, or I'm not perfect. When you can't say those things to somebody, how are they ever going to get to really know you and be, I learned this also through cancer. When people ask, can I help you? I would say yes. Not if I needed the help, I would say yes, because they offered and they wanted to be part of my process. Yeah. That's a bonding experience. For sure. You know, when somebody said, I want to come to chemo with you, it wasn't just to support me. It was because they, they love me and they want to be close to me. And my saying to them, no, you can't come with me or no, this, or no, I don't need your help is basically saying, stay there, stay there. And that's the same thing we're doing when we're not being honest with people and we're not speaking our truths. I mean, you know, I speak a lot of truths. You said something to me the other day where you said, Oh, you know, um, I'm going to blow you up when you said, um, Oh, but you're, we were talking about my divorce a little and you said, Oh, but you're probably the breadwinner. And I'm like, honestly, my business has suffered this year dramatically. And honestly, in the last three years, since I've gotten sick, my business has dramatically suffered. So yes, I would love to be able to stand up in the industry and say, I'm a rock star and, you know, I make billions of dollars a year. That has not been the case for the last few years. I'm okay. But now that I'm getting divorced, it's a, it's, I'm in a much different position and we're in COVID and people aren't booking shoots right now. So I have to rework some things for sure. And when I say that to people, they're like, why would you admit that out loud? I'm like, cause it's the truth. It's the truth. And I'm no different than any other photographer or business owner out there. Why can't I say that? So either you, you, you know, don't like me anymore. You don't want to follow me, whatever. That's your business. Or you say, Hey, you know what? She's a real person just like me. And she's got stuff too. And that's really all it is. And now we've, we've bonded, right? We have a connection and I don't know. I just, I I love you, Jen. And there are going to be tons of guys that the good ones are going to love everything about Jen. And you're right that you have the perfect set of filters. Your, your, yeah. your foobs. Let me, let me. Yeah. <laughs> For- the, foobs are the, the foob filter. And yeah. And if anybody out there is like, Oh, Jen's single now, I'm going to hit her up. I swear to God, if you tell me you're a good guy, I'm blocking you. <laughs> you know, the, blocking my, you. my version of foobs were my, my children. So I actually on my <laughs> dating profile i got so tired of like weird i even had like some people that were like oh my gosh i've been following you for so long we should get a cup of coffee and i was like this is definitely not what i want um yeah so the first i also have a teenage daughter that's yes. a very big filter so I, that was the image that i had first and foremost was like me holding my two kids that was like yes. picture number one right and, in or uh, out. you're it, in or out <laughs> it was it was a good filter it found me the the person that you know is a is a wonderful partner um but I am, I am curious to ask now, having gone through, having gone through these things, it, it's, you're easily one of the most empathetic and understanding people. And also one of the strongest people that I know. And I'm curious, having gone through what you have now and, and divorce being added to that, what is going to drive this next chapter for you? Like, I, I guess I'm asking, cause I felt a very immediate shift personally, um, in, what I wanted to do career wise. Do you still find the same interest and joy in photography and, and, and education and, and teaching like, or do you feel a shift coming? There's been a shift coming for some time. I think that the pandemic, um, has expedited that shift. Um, 
I still love teaching. I love photography and anybody that wants to have me at a conference or at a teaching thing, I will do it a hundred percent because the truth is that I want to change as many women's lives as possible. And I can't do it by myself. So the more photographers that I can educate and then they can go out and change women's lives, it's that ripple effect. So a hundred percent, I am not looking to leave photography. Let's just make that very, very clear. Yes. But, um, I do feel like for a long time that I was kind of working this like whirlwind of like, well, I have to do this. Everybody's doing this. I have to do this. And, and I just felt like I was getting swept up with like what everybody was doing. And I was like, I don't really want to be doing that. I always felt like I was the kind of person that was like, if everybody's doing a, I'm going to go do B that's how I'm going to get noticed. And I just kind of found myself, you know, well, people are having online education platforms. So I need to do that too. And people are doing online classes now and, and zooms and then I have to do that too. I've just kind of taken a step back um, and just trying to understand what I really want. And what I think I really, really want is to really work with women that have had breast cancer or have had mastectomies or, you know, uh, risk reducing or whatever it might be. That is where, that is where, that's where I'm meant to be. That is why this happened. You know, I, I always believe that this happened for me, not to me. And that involves photography, but it also involves, you know, my writing and it involves maybe some programs and it involves right now I'm doing some work with my plastic surgeon. I convinced him to hire me to do work on his social media because he doesn't have time for it. And my feeling is every woman in the New York area should know about you. And so you need to hire me to get the word out there. And so it's not photography work, but it is photography work. I take pictures of his clients and I help him get things out there. And really my job is not a photographer. My job is, um, somebody who uses her camera to change the world. Mm -hmm. And so I do it with my camera and without my camera. And so for me, anything that really falls in the realm of helping women the way that I can, I'm willing to do. And and that's why I wrote the book. And that's why, you know, I'd love to, I'm, I'm working on a program for women to help them get their lives back together after cancer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not looking to give up photography, but I think I have more to offer the world also. It's just interesting because these kind of moments, um, if you, if you embrace them for what they are, you come through the other side with a, a very, uh, clear, uh, I want to say like a clarified purpose, um, mm-hmm. where before, you know, 10 years ago, you might've identified yourself as a photographer or an artist. Now you identify yourself as basically a person with a message to empower women and you'll use whatever medium gets you there. Um, and I kind of found the same thing personally after going through what I did was as much as I love photography, I'm not like, like you, I'm not leaving it. But at the same time, I realized photography is not what I am or who I am. What I am is educational frameworks that make difference in people's lives. Like, Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my, the, the kind of impetus for going and saying, okay, I have all this data. I don't know if you, you've gotten this far in the book yet, but the the book was me writing down characteristics and attributes from my clients, from being on the other side of the lens and just photographing mm-hmm. till I had hundreds of these case studies mm-hmm. and then going, you know, I've read all the books that my, my counselors have read. I've been through, you know, 15 years of this, I'm going to take my stab at this. And as I started writing out a framework for relationships, I was like, how did I get lost in thinking that I'm a photographer? Not, not to Mm -hmm. say that if you're a photographer, I know photographers who are photographers. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I had this conversation with Lindsay Adler. She Mm. is a photographer through, you know, like this is, she has found this spark and this thing. And, and, and honestly, she makes people like me think that I'm really more of a camera owner. Um, Mm -hmm. the the work that she does is just absolutely incredible in the way that Mm -hmm. her, her drive is. But I, 10 years ago, I had convinced myself that I was a photographer. And in reality, my life has been frameworks for learning languages and then frameworks Mm -hmm. for creativity and then frameworks for photography and then frameworks for lighting and business. And then now frameworks for relationships. And I was like, Mm -hmm how did it take a reset to realize that my purpose is frameworks? Yeah. So it's interesting coming through the other side of seeing where you're at now and, and your purpose being empowering women and helping those going through cancer. 
Yeah. You know, my, my tagline for my business for years was shamelessly feminine, but the, the, that came from the tagline. I help women celebrate their unique femininity and celebrate it shamelessly. Yeah. None of that is about photography. I mean, it is, it's all about photography, but none of it's about photography. And you can take that statement and put it into any area of what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, it's really all just about helping women be shamelessly feminine. And I have no doubt that when I get through this divorce, it's going to involve that too, helping women, you know, get out of relationships they don't want to be in or finding that self-love or that self-worth and understanding that they can make different decisions if that's what they want. Um, you know, every life experience I have, I just truly believe is meant to help somebody else in this world. You know, I don't think I'm an expert. I don't have a PhD in, you know, um, anything, but you know, I, I went to the school of hard knocks, you know, I've lived a lot of experience in my short 40 something years. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I can, you know, women come to me, women come to me every day with messages. I, I need to make decision about my surgery and I don't know how to make this decision. Or Jen, is it normal that I'm crying every single day after surgery? Or, you know, a woman today said to me, I just want you to know, um, I left my husband for the, for the last time. I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm leaving him. They, they come to me for all sorts of things. For some reason, they see me as this authority on, on womanhood. And I'm like, hey, guys, I, I'm in it with you. I'm just trying to figure it out myself, you know. But the truth is that I really believe that these experiences happen for me to then shed light to other women and to, to help other women. And I, there's a lot of women out there doing this work. You know, it's just not I'm not it's not exclusive to me. Um I'm not even saying I'm the best at it, but I do believe that it's bigger than just photography because I, I think I'm an okay photographer. I I, I feel the same way about myself, but you are a fantastic photographer. (laughs) As are you. Um, but it's not, but, and I don't want to say that I don't care, but I'm about to say, I don't care. I don't care. Do I want to get better? Yes. Do I want to challenge myself and try new setups and try new lights and all that? Yeah. A hundred percent. Cause I'm a creative and I love that stuff. Um, but that's not my, that's not my end game. You know, my end game is like, okay, I'm going to take this photograph of this woman. I'm going to show off her, this side of her, how can I use my creative skills to do so? I'm not led by the technical. I'm led by the woman, the emotion, and then I just figure out the technical to get there. Um, so it's, it is, the photography is secondary to the empowerment. It's just a tool to get there. You know, I, I truly feel like, and, and I think the world is waking up to this idea slowly, um, but the best leaders, the best authorities are the ones that are exactly like you who said, I'm just figuring this out myself. Um, but they might just be a few steps ahead in the process. And I Mm -hmm. think the, to me, I have met more doctors who have no fucking clue what's going on than I can, Mm -hmm. you know, doctors of psychology and counselors and people that have 10 years of experience. And I have stood in their offices and well, sat in their offices and multiple have said to me things like, I don't know how to help you. You've mm-hmm. read all the books that I have in mm-hmm. theory, this should be working. You know, I, I <laughs> like there's, I, and I think you see it. There's a new wave of media and content from people that are actually piecing things together in a way that's relatable. You know, one of the things that's difficult about having so much formal ed- education about something is you're taken away from the actual reality and the relatability of the that human thing. touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, you speak in a way that's clinical. You're detached from the actual reality of what's going on. And frankly, when someone comes into your office and you have all these credentials, they're not even acting or speaking to you in a authentic manner. They're just Mm -hmm. presenting the version of themselves that they think you'll accept. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it was such a crazy notion to me. Like, how is it that marital counseling, which by the way, is 20% effective in creating lasting change. Right. How is this like the norm? Like, Oh, if you're, you know, if you're having issues, go and sit down and have an awkwardly uncomfortable meeting telling <laughs> this stranger who has all sorts of, you know, Their documents on their wall. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and it becomes this weird, like, okay, I'm going to present my version and try and get them to agree with me. And then the other person's like, I'm going to present my version and try to get them to agree with me. And then what ends up happening is this person that's right in the middle is basically just like, "Mm -hmm. 
tell me what you guys think you should do. And you're like, what the right. fuck? Like, is this $200 what we paid $200 <laughs> for to like right. listen to this? And then you walk away and you're like, you read a statistic that says this marital counseling is, uh, you know, any form of counseling is 20% effective. And you're like, man, in what other area of my life would I, <laughs> would I spend $200 on something that's 20% effective? Like, right. Exactly. Not exactly. to mention repeatedly visit like over and over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's something, <laughs> but that, you know, that's the thing too. And, and I, I don't know, did you feel like, um, I'm going to flip the switch now. I'm going to ask the questions. Did you feel <laughs> when you wrote your book, did you have like an imposter syndrome moment of like, you know, who, who am I to write this book? I don't have a degree in this or Hardcore. I don't know. Yeah. Hardcore. Cause I like, I almost didn't write the book because I felt like, or, and I'm having it even now with building this program. Like the program is basically done. I filmed the things I did. I'm just having a hard time actually putting it out there. Cause I keep saying, well, I'm not a therapist. I don't have a social work degree. I don't have a, you know, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I'm nothing. And, and, you know, I'm just a girl who had cancer. So who am I to give people advice, you know, but I guess we have to learn in this day and age that we can learn probably the most from people who have I don't know what's going on here. Who have been through it? I can't tell where the butt is and where his head is. I know. Me neither. (laughs) Um, You know, he just likes to sit behind me. It's so funny. Um, You know, should I be even putting this out there? Am I qualified to run a program like this? Am I? You know, would anybody even trust me, or would they spend money on this just because I had cancer? You know, but. Um, I'm going to take off his collar. So he stops making so much noise. Um, that's the funny thing though, is from the outside looking at your experiences, I would say you are the most qualified. And it honestly took a friend telling me the same thing in my book, uh, in the early versions of it, there was a introduction that was like, there was like a page long piece of me saying how I'm not qualified to be writing this book. (laughs) And then he he read it and he was like, dude, this book is really good. You got to stop with that kind of crap. (laughs) And it turned into like, you know, it turned into one sentence. That's like, look, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but that's exactly why I'm asking you to read this book. Um, I I think that that's honestly what makes you qualified and what makes you relatable. Uh, Mm. But it's also the reason that I'm on my probably like my seventh or eighth edit of this book because I know for the first time I'm stepping outside of this realm that everybody knows me in. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if I'm going to step outside of the realm, I'm going to step outside and make this so good that people, you know, have no, they can't refuse it. You know what I mean? Like, so it's made me hypersensitive to Mm -hmm. making sure that this product is probably a little bit beyond like I probably could have released it, you know, one or two edits ago, but I'm, I'm like mm-hmm. still, that's my imposter syndrome. Like you, you got to make it better. You got to make it even better. Yeah. Like you, for me too, I feel like every time somebody asks me for a copy or they buy a copy, I'm like, Oh my God, I hope they're going to like it. I hope it's going to change their life. I hope it's going to, you know, it's like, I get so wrapped up in like every single, you know, what are they going to think? What is going to happen? But, you know, it lands on the right people in the right way, you know, and, and like I said, I didn't get a chance to read the whole book because you sent it to me, you know, just a short time ago, but the, there were certain things that really hopped out at me that I'm like, oh yeah, that's totally relatable. I get that, mm-hmm. you know, and especially in a situation like mine, I, I am, I'm asking myself so much, like, am I capable of good relationships? Was this just a fluke thing? Is this, you know, I'm evaluating all my relationships, you know, am I the problem? Maybe I was the problem, you know, did I did I screw up? Am I, you know, and, and so it's really good for me. And I think this is a good time pandemic wise to really really reevaluate relationships because when we come out of this pandemic and we have to see people again, you know, who are you going to want to see? Who do you not miss? You know, who do you want to spend your precious time with? Who do you not miss? I like that. I like that question. That was the first thing I said when I made my first video after the pandemic. I'm like, just take note of who maybe you don't miss because that's so much more telling than who you do miss. Or the, the people who are equally in lockdown and have free time, but don't respond to text messages and you're like, now you've got no reason to (laughs) not respond. So funny. Although I'm definitely, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely feeling like iPhone burnout. Like there are some days I don't even want to look look at my phone. I'm like, I just can't, I can't, I have, you know, let's see right now I have, um, Oh, I was trying to text you before actually, cause I, I couldn't find the link, but, uh, uh, you know, I have, let's see, 24 text messages since we started talking, you know, like, yeah, I just, some days I just don't want to, I'm like, eh, I'll answer you tomorrow. It's all good. 
Yeah. No. What's the difference between today and tomorrow? <laughs> I feel you for sure. I, I, I feel that burnout. And I think the two places that I participate now from a social media standpoint are TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. I feel that burnout on Facebook where I just, I haven't yeah. been on in long, like <sighs> it's either my team or it's scheduled messages that go up, mm-hmm. but I, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't even have a desire to check or to look. It's just like, well, just so you know, my 15 year old daughter was like, mom, Facebook is so yesterday. Yeah. So it's over. As far as I'm concerned, it's over. Like I was like, Oh, I'll just stop checking it out because if you said it's not relevant, it is gone. (laughs) This is very (laughs) true. It is going to be wiped off the face of the earth. She scared me though. She said to me, Instagram's next. And I was like, (gasps) no, it's true. I think people are, are tired. Um, they're getting tired of like the inauthenticity of, of what it is to influence and to like, like the, the whole term influencer, I said it jokingly earlier, you know, like if you want to be an influencer, you can't share anything real, but that's kind of the truth of it. It's like, so then, so then what? So it's TikTok, TikTok's bullshit. I mean, listen, I love TikTok. Don't get me wrong, but like my dad is pretty obsessed with TikTok and he sends (laughs) them to me all day long. And there are some fat, I mean, amazing TikToks that he sends me of these whales jumping and like these stars. And I'm like, dad, just because it's on TikTok doesn't mean it's real. You know, he'll be yeah. like, this is amazing. I'm like, dad, it's photoshopped. What do you, what's the matter with you? You know, he's like, oh, it never even really occurred to me. You know, I'm like, just because it's on TikTok doesn't make it real. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. So, okay, TikTok, what else? What's next? Tell me, because I- I'm scared. I honestly feel like we each, like I'm gravitating towards just, this is kind of how it's worked for me, at least in the last like decade. Um, When it came to learning about photography, I felt like, man, there's no place that I really want to like participate in. I'm Mm going to just make my own place to, to do that. And that was, that became SLR lounge. Now it's like, I don't know that I'm getting any of the social interaction I actually want from any of these platforms. Um, Mm -hmm. I think they're great platforms to put messages out, not so Mm -hmm. much to like interact with. So now for me, it's the podcast. Like I, I really Mm -hmm. want this to be the place that kind of feeds me personally, um, and feeds who I am and, and just having like, just getting to know you better, like getting to actually mm-hmm. sit down with my friends, um, with people that I want to get to know and to actually have good, authentic conversations that I leave feeling enriched from. And so mm-hmm. to me, it's more so like, OK, let's create the environment that feeds mm-hmm. me. And then I'm just going to use whatever platforms are available at the time to just put that out to everybody mm-hmm. else. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that that's my YouTube. I think that's where I'm going to focus for the yeah. year. Um, I made a lot of videos since the day that I was, um, diagnosed with cancer. Um, I just have been making random video. I mean, they're not even good videos, like just like random videos and I haven't really put any work into it, but I have a little following on there. And I think that, you know, I get a lot of messages all the time. Your videos saved me through the process. It was so good to know the realities, you know, what the doctors don't tell you. And so I've really been thinking a lot about really pushing that for 2021. Your, your story is so powerful, Jen. I, I feel like Thank there's you. so much that you could potentially do with it going yeah. forward. Um, I mean, there's I so much that you've so. already done. <laughs> like <laughs> it, we're talking as if like you haven't, like you've literally been on creative live. You've taught tens of thousands of people. You're a Nikon ambassador. You're, you've got a book, you've got all these different things. Um, and I feel like the story is only getting richer and richer as you go forward. So it, it feels like you can do anything. Thanks. I think what it feels like is I'm starting over. It's a fresh start for me. Does and it? so even though I have done all of those things and I, there's still a lot of things out there that I have done, I feel very much like this is a fresh start for me. What and, gives you that uh, sense? <sighs> I feel I it too. I, I feel it too. But yeah. what, what is, what is, what are you feeling? I just don't feel married to anything anymore. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that except for that. I don't feel married to anything. I feel like coming out of my marriage, I realized that I am not committed to do anything that I don't want to do anymore. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was the biggest commitment in my entire life. Now it's like, oh, you don't want to teach there? You don't have to teach anymore if you don't want to. Yeah. You don't have to photograph people if you don't want to. You don't have to answer to anybody, you know? Like you can now make this life whatever you want it to be. And it's, um, I, I'm not trying to poo-poo things. Like, of course, I love working with Nikon and I would love to be a Nikon ambassador until the day, you know, I'm not here anymore. But I'm just saying that, um, I've always felt pressure. There's pressure in the industry when you have a yeah. name, I think, to, well, you have to speak here and you have to do this and you have to do that. And I have done at times things that have made me unhappy. And I just feel like I don't have to anymore. And I don't care if somebody, you know, I could go out tomorrow and be like, you know what? My studio is not making as much money as it was. I'm getting divorced. I need to go get a job part time. And I have no shame in that, you know, like I'll just do whatever I want to do. I'll do what I like, or even creating the social media business that I've created, to, you know, help my plastic surgeon. Now I have another client on the, in the works right now. Okay, so what if I become a social media manager for a little while that also uses her photography and I only take clients that, you know, rock it with women and help them empower women? You know, like I'm just I'm just free to be whoever the hell I want to be on any given day. That's that's how I feel about it now. Where before it was like, well, I can't do this because people are gonna think that this or P, you know, I just don't care anymore. It's just a rebirth. I'm just gonna try new things, do new things, experience things. I agree. That's the beautiful part about remaking yourself and, and giving up on, on those pieces and just being like, I'm, I'm going to be who I am without any feeling of shame or remorse. Like there, there is such a freedom in that. And, and I felt the exact same way when I came through the other side of my divorce and, and trying to figure out kind of each of these pieces, um, this notion of like, I don't got to do anything I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have mm -hmm. to do any of it. And what's funny is we're so often put into these places because of those social pressures. And it's not just like your relationship, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, the people that put out a TikTok video and it goes viral and mm -hmm. then suddenly they feel pressured to go and do more of that thing because that's what yep. people wanted from them. And yeah. soon they find themselves with a couple million followers, but everybody says, you know, bark monkey, this is your job. And this is what you got to do because this is what we know you for. And before yeah. you realize it, you're just doing this thing that you became known for, but it's not necessarily who you are. Yep. And it's that way yep. in almost everything like yep. relation. And, and when you say fuck it to all of it, you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, Listen, I, you know, I, um, without naming names, I had this with, um, a company that I worked with in the industry that was starting to tell me to like, you know, put clothes on clients. We need you to start putting clothes on people because, and we need you to talk about this and we need you to talk about that. I was like, well, I think this maybe was not going to work out for us because you hire me for me. And if yeah. you're trying to make me, not me, I'm not down with that. Yeah. You know, I'm not okay with that. And so I think maybe this isn't working out anymore, you know? Um, it's hard though. It's hard because, you know, you're trying to make a living and you're like, okay, they're paying bills and it, you know, they're the clients really. Right. And so if they want me to do this, then should I do that? But I was just like, no, I'm not selling myself out for that. You know, and I still stand by that. I get tons of emails all the time. Do you want to be an ambassador? Do you want to do a paid ad for us? You, and I just go, no, I don't. Sorry. It's not what I want to turn my Instagram into. Do I ever, you know, do I ever say yes? Yes. If it's something I believe in. You know, um, if something I use, something that I, I think is going to make women's lives better. Yeah, I'll agree to that. That's fine. But I'm not just like, you know, saying yes to everybody for everything. It's not, that's not my jam, but yeah, now it's even more freedom. I mean, like the world better fucking watch out because I just, I really believe that. Like, and I'm not even like, oh, I'm so great. I'm so, I'm just saying like, I'm just so free. I just feel so free and it's so good. And, you know, even my mom asked me for, about something and she said, you know, are you ready to make a commitment to that? And I'm like, nope, sorry. I will, I will help you with this or help you with that, but I cannot commit for more than like a day at a time because I am just in a non-committal phase right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm not committing to anything because tomorrow I can change my mind and nobody can stop me. You know, the only thing I'm committed to right now is the relationship with myself. And that, you know, I was joking with my friend earlier, we were talking about, you know, um, being polyamorous. And I said, Oh, my only, my version of polyamorous is being in love with somebody else, but also being in love with myself. <laughs> and that, you know, and that's my goal right now is to really foster the relationship with myself, because I think that 
when you're in a relationship, especially that's not working, you lose that so easily. And just, you know, rediscovering that and who I am and hearing my own voice in my head has been a really fun, cool process and hard, by the way, really hard, but I'm super committed to myself right now. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Well, interestingly, that is the way that you're going to help and change the most people around you. So that is how it's done. And you have put us all on notice. So you have to promise me <laughs> that in a few months, you're going to come back and, and give us an update on what's latest and greatest with you. Yeah, let's hope it's a few months. Let's hope, uh, you know, that everything is done in a few months. And then we'll we'll see. I don't know. But I'm kind of like, I am skeptical to say that I'm I'm looking forward to 2021. Because Dang, but um, <laughs> you know, it's. Fun. I did a video. I'll tell you this really fast. I did a video actually in early 2020. It was like right after New Year's or right before New Year's, something like that. And I did a video of like, stop saying this is your year or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was like, I'm like, here's the thing. You all go into the new year and everyone's like, yes, it's the new year and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And by December, you're like, fuck. 2020. It's been a terrible. <laughs> I said, here's the thing. I guarantee that you're going to go through trauma this year. I guarantee you're going to go through hard things that something is going to suck. Like you can't just say, Oh, it's the turn of the clock. So now we're going to have this amazing year. Just doesn't work like that. Yeah. So, uh, I, little did I know I was predicting the future, but, um, so I'm skeptical to say I'm excited for 2021, but I am eagerly interested in what it's going to be for me because I really don't know a hundred percent. And that's kind of fun for somebody who's always planned everything for my whole life. It's kind of fun to live in this place of, I don't know, the world is my oyster right now. Yeah. I, I, have you watched the movie soul yet? No, it's on my list to actually maybe do tonight. It's worth it. Go do is it. it yeah, make cry? Is it make it'll cry? probably make you cry, but it was one well, of those I'm movies where text you when I'm crying with the ugly crying face. Cause I'm, I also am sort of in that phase, <laughs> by the way, that it, it might be like an, an open dam. Like it might not, I might not stop crying. It okay. might not stop. <laughs> Let, let's make a, let's make a, a bet that if you start crying, you press the record button and record it until it stops because that in and okay. of itself will make it stop. You'll be like, I don't want this to go like 60 seconds long. <laughs> But the, um, there was something that, that happened when I, when I, just to close this, when I went through my divorce, there was a shift in, um, gosh, before, you know, when I was in my marriage, I, I was, there was always this destination. It was always this place that I had to be of like, you know, I'm going to be happy when I do this. And there was just unbridled ambition, like to the point where I was just 80 hour weeks, just knocking my head against the wall, like I'm going to be happy when I get to this place. This is where it exists. And, and in having everything stripped away and I was sitting there in my one bedroom apartment, um, and I, I went from having a home to like, I, I had, <laughs> I had a race car that I sold just to like, like all of this stuff I, I, I had, I moved out, I had a couch and a bed and a TV that I borrowed from the office. Mm. And in that moment in walking to my, my apartment, which was all my own and having my children with me, I was like more excited than anything, like any other time that I've ever had in in my life. I was, I was so excited. And I realized that what stood in front of me was this journey and this new adventure that I could rebuild however I wanted. And I realized there's no destination. This is, this is the joy. This is the moment. This is the fun, you know? And and uh, it was that perspective, like in going into 2020, where we've had a lot of rough things and and by and large, globally, the pandemic has been absolutely horrific. And this isn't to take mm-hmm. away anything from that. Mm-hmm. But from a personal standpoint, it's also been one of the best years of my life in terms of mm-hmm. the time that I've been able to spend with my family, the growth that I've experienced. And everybody's had to pivot and just figure things out. And just it, to me, like there's there's certain I think some people thrive on that. Like you, you, you thrive on like, you know, mm-hmm. throw me some challenges. I, I, I want to be able to move and shake and change and grow and, and do those mm-hmm. things. So I know of this yeah. excitement very well. And, um, the, the movie soul will kind of do a good job of speaking to you and, and, and to everybody about the journey. Well, but I'm excited. You know after I watch it. Cause you'll be getting text messages of me crying. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited. Not for, I'm not excited for the text message. <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> I'm excited to see Can't everything to that you do. Like <laughs> Thank you, you. You've done so much. You've been impactful um, across the industry, across women's lives, not only your clients, but um, everywhere. And I can only imagine what this new chapter is going to be. So please commit to only one thing. And that is uh, actually you can commit to whatever you want, but at least come back and update us. <laughs> I will commit to that. I promise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This was so good. I can't remember. And, you know, the one thing about all of these conversations online, which, you know, I think we're all a little burned out from, but at the same time, when's the last time you sat and spoke to somebody for two hours uninterrupted and got to learn about them? And I just appreciate everything that you've shared. It's really moved me quite a bit and it's made me feel not alone in this process. So thank you. Well, it's been amazing having you. And before we jump off, um, what we're going to throw all the links to kind of your work, your Instagram, everything into our show notes. But is there anything specifically that you'd like our audience to kind of check out? Well, Instagram is where it's like my daily journal. I write all my thoughts and share all my pictures on Instagram, which is just Jen Rosenbaum with a Z, of course. <clears throat> but if anybody is looking for anything Jen Rosenbaum, they can just go to jenrosenbaum.com and you'll be linked to everything there. Perfect. Awesome, Jen. Well, I can't wait to uh, chat again in the future. Me too. Thank you. Talk soon.